Well, thank you so much, Erin, for that overview. Uh, I feel very close to your area of research. As we've said so often, it's almost like this present mode of operation going towards a future mode of operation, but it's not that easy. Change management is very difficult. Actually understanding the user's requirements is also difficult. Often roboticists and technologists and engineers seize on these opportunities because there is a business case to be had. And in my background uh, in the telecommunications industry, training was a big part of our bids uh, as we went uh, to provide a tender a forward and a response to people who needed things. And often training was the first thing to go. You know, this what's this 20% figure or this 10% figure or this token $20,000, depending on the relative cost of the system itself. The higher the top of the capital expenditure, usually the greater the percent of training costs. So we were always wrestling with, well, this is our Rolls Royce response uh, to the actual operator or service provider, and in this case, organizations. But when people start to look at the bottom line, they do actually go for those training costs and try to slash them out of oblivion. We don't need training. We have a whole bunch of very smart people. Uh, the robots will do the work and the AI will be smart enough. But still, even though we're introducing adaptive training systems, we need training for the adaption of the training systems we're <laughs> introducing. So in the business case, we can say we're going to do nothing, we're going to do something, or we're going to go with everything. And those various levels of detail are determined after a business case is done. And really with robotics and AI in this particular system, we are looking at several factors in the business case. One is, can we increase our revenues? Two, could, be, could we minimize our costs? And three, could be a story about compliance and regulation. And so in the future of work that I look at, I look at all of these various things that are elements in the business case and try to tie them back to user design principles. And that's where my work intersects uh, with Erin Chu's work on human systems engineering. Erin goes down to that task level um, to look at now what do we need and how will we do it? And at the same time, I'm looking at the socioeconomics. And I'm also looking at the socio-technical legal as I will present today. I have a few affiliations of which I'll name a few. Uh, with the IEEE working in their RFID Council as a board member, with the Society on the Social Implications of Technology, because this is going to change everything rapidly. We're not just talking about automation, we're talking about the step after automation, which is really what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution, or AI-fying our manufacturing or retail processes. We've already seen COVID give us a jolt with regards to where we're going, and it's not unusual now to walk into retail outlets that actually have no humans whatsoever. Here in Australia, uh, there is a chain that you all probably know very well, Target, uh, owned by Myers and a few others, and they have literally got one person on the floor that I've seen when I visited recently. The rest is kiosk based and the rest is self-service. And this has been very interesting to watch how consumers are also becoming a part of the future of work. It's consumer work. We go to buy something and we do everything that the worker previously did. So I think there is a rapid change here in the digital transformation that is occurring. We as consumers are also part of the worker sort of expectation. We now take our own goods, scan them through the checkout. We now take them and test them ourselves before purchase. I also work for the Australian Privacy Foundation. Some of you might think, what in the world would the Privacy Foundation have to do with the future of work? But I want you to think about a future where you turn up and you've got robot co-workers who are waiting for your every command, almost at your feet, saying, what do you want me to do next? I'm ready to go, let's do it. And so through these interactions, which are being captured on audit systems and being logged, there is some form of surveillance going on as well. So it's going to be a whole new contractual agreement when workers decide to take on an employment opportunity at a workplace. Uh, I see this when we're talking about robots for aged care facilities that are there to take linen throughout the facility so that the nursing staff or carers uh, of the aged can be set free to do other tasks. And we also see this with robot vacuum cleaners in large establishments like shopping malls. There they go around uh, and the, the, the imagination says, well, there's no need to clean anything anymore because people uh, are looking for the robots to do the cleaning. 
And we can see these different kinds of use case scenarios where we think, now what is the requirement? Interestingly, when I've given interviews uh, online about the implications of robot vacuum cleaners, the implications of robots at aged care facilities, the establishments haven't want to slash the labor cost. They've been more interested in upskilling and reskilling. And this is where our work really comes in handy. Uh, in order to get to this point, we interviewed 23 people from various industries, some of them from the high tech fabrication space, some of them from chip manufacturing, uh, some of them from aged care and hospitals, uh, nurses. And it was very interesting to hear their anecdotal stories about what they do day in, day out, and how adaptive training systems may well be the answer to some of their woes. And so as I go through fairly quickly uh, in this presentation, uh, I'll make sure to um, reference some of these things. So what we're seeing is industrial robotics everywhere, autonomous systems coming in, uh, they're ubiquitous in manufacturing. Uh, my father, uh, who was a glass factory worker, a leading hand back in the 70s, Basically, his job was taken in the early 80s through automation. Uh, he used to be the one looking at broken bottles on the conveyor belt. I'm glad he doesn't have glass in his fingers anymore, but such was the displacement where he was actually made redundant. What we're looking at now, because if all of these workers are made redundant, is new opportunities for them to actually interact. It's not about robots replacing humans. It's about co-workers. It's about working together, finding out which tasks the robot can do better than the, than the human perhaps, or is less dangerous for the human to take on, or is more dangerous for the robot to take on. And so we start to look at danger, harm, all of these ethical scenarios, justice issues even in this process, what should be taken on by the robot and what should be left alone to be taken on by the human. But there is this collaboration that we're talking about and we're hoping to see in all sorts of things, even detailed kinds of scenarios where uh, the task is to put together a very finite uh, piece of equipment, maybe, for example, on aeroplanes. So there are many dimensions I've gone through fairly quickly, the economics, the technical, the social, the legal, and these relational issues between each. I don't want you to think that economics is the winner here, or the technical is the most important, although roboticists and engineers will often tell you, we just want to talk technical. Um, but increasingly, they're becoming aware that user-centered design is so important, which is why Erin's work and Kurt's is so, so significant. The legalities around this, well, what happens if there's an accident in the workplace and it is the fault of the robot, but the human it has been harmed? How do we deal with these uh, governance and policy rules within the organization? And all of these things are jostling for space, mind space, corporation space, executive space, and also societal space as we navigate through them. Everything here is new. And previous analyses, literally, when I look at socioeconomic templates and I look at papers that have been uh, written on this space, they're all very surface level, very high level, the revenue, the operational expenditure, the capital expenditure, and yes, the net present value is. But there hasn't been significant work done on the actual sub line items, which shed light on the actual practices. So at first glance, replacing humans in the workflow seems incredibly cost effective. Robots don't take breaks. They don't have health and life insurance requirements. There's no injury compensation. You're not gonna get by the robot employee uh, a bill at the end of the day for a sore back. And there's no family leave and so much more. Well, that's the misnomer that we think at first point that this makes total sense. But as Elon Musk learned, uh, he said he went uh, completely digital too early in the manufacturer process of some of his products and stepped back from that, announcing that on Twitter about six months ago. So there is a consideration here to be had. There are costs for introducing a digital transformation process and products in your manufacturing plant. These include, it costs energy to run systems, digital systems. There's maintenance and maintenance doesn't happen like once a year. Uh, like taking your car for a service. When we're talking about robots, they break down quite often. In fact, anecdotal evidence tells us from organizations we've spoken to in general, that in fact, it costs people a lot of money to stop the machine, go and see what's wrong with its production. Why is it happening? Correct something perhaps in software or in the hardware componentry. 
and then start the process again. And in fact, we call this a buckle in the supply chain often when we are, for example, with large sheets of metal trying to manufacture things and we've got a stoppage. And that rolling stop actually costs organizations a lot of money throughout the year. But we are looking at product, quality, volume, and other kinds of indicators that we know in the manufacturing space. There are costs from errors and faults. We spoke to some uh, informants who said, look, it was producing things, it looked right, but it didn't fit. And the workaround was not actually to change the instructions, for instance, in the 3D printing. It was to keep going and somehow make the most of that, that, that mold by adding another uh, sediment or component to actually get it to glue together, which again is not good practice because that leads to faults further down in product development and design. Training and adaptation to new environments. You can't really expect your workers to turn up uh, and go, okay, you know, now we've got a system that we can look at and ask questions to. People need training and from many people that we ask, what kinds of training would they like? They actually mentioned video training. They've often relied on their coworkers for on the job training, but sometimes coworkers make mistakes in how they actually tell the instructions. So a video or, for example, some system that we're wearing that we can look down towards and get on the job um, instructions and next, 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 as we do that, we've investigated that over time. Also obsolescence. The speed at which we are creating products is so quick that, in fact, um, buying something for the long term may not be necessarily what an organization wants to do. Maybe they want robots as a service and they're paying an ongoing fee. So rather than it being a capital expenditure where you buy a bunch of robots for your manufacturing plant, what you're doing is looking at this over time in an operational capacity. So it's, you know, like photocopiers, if they break down, we'll take it away and we want another one that works. So perhaps what we're doing is going through a system of economics where we're thinking about these things. And we've got to look at it longitudinally and contextually. We just can't say this rules or these rules fit for all of the manufacturing companies out there. Context is really important. Bringing the worker back in the loop, you know, getting away from this, this mentality that says robots are going to do everything. You know, I look at these reports, I'm very cynical about these reports that have written off 30% or 40% of the workforce. What we're trying to do in this project, and I hope we get the phase two $5 million uh, raise um, grant uh, that we're bidding for actually today. What I think we want to do is make sure that we're going to maximize the amount of people who can stay in the workforce, even if automation is, is coming through at rapid fire. What we want to do is maintain people's work environments. So if they get displaced by a machine, they're able somehow to be in the loop of another machine that helps the company generate more revenue. How do laborers feel about introducing robots into the workflow? A lot of them have safety questions. A lot of them have comfort questions. You know, I forget command lines very easily. Do I have to remember a set of commands uh, as Kurt was alluding to, or is it more intuitive? Can I use natural language? Uh, is it going to be talk like talking to an Alexa? And the other thing is robots are not just physical. Many of them are going to be chatbots. They're going to be uh, software based without actually a hardware enclosure. And most of them will not be anthropomorphic, uh, even though we see this in science fiction all the time. Uh, more practical may be arms that actually lift things and put things in places. Feasibility, is it feasible for a number of different feasibility issues and worker and system expectations? So human robot interactions, if you take anything away from this talk, they're socio-technical, they're bi-directional flows, they're not just unidirectional. It's about robots responding to humans and humans responding to robots. And can we acknowledge the efficiencies of robotics without displacing the workers, as I was saying? How can we get more workers to be upskilled quickly by using these kinds of systems They become even more useful to their corporations, allowing them to uh, entertain ways of seeking uh, more outcomes? and strategies for protecting laborers. We haven't really talked much about legislation, but redistributing job tasks, retraining, reskilling. Uh, and I gave the example of the vicinity shopping centers that had introduced uh, vacuum cleaners. But as I know from anecdotal evidence, there are some things that those vacuum cleaners can't pick up, like small staples that have been accidentally dropped somewhere, particular types uh, of 
uh, materials, like liquid materials. So early project directions, characterizing multiple working environments. Do we want an environment that's human only? And where, where do we sit on that human to robot spectrum? Well, we sit somewhere where we need both humans and robots working together. Building the business case for training and worker engagement. I'm an advocate of reintroducing the training component better than we've ever done before, because that is actually something that will help us produce better items. It's not just a training component that you tack on, it's embedded into the user design process. Optimizing task distribution, the notion of lifting and moving, tasks that are computational, that are sorting, adaptive tasks. Which ones can the robots really do faster and more efficiently? And where do they collapse in terms of complexity in problem solving for that task? What about last mile tasks? Are they good for robots or not? What about precision tasks? Does it help us to have a robot building those precision tasks where they can, you know, millimeter error can mean that a product fails uh, and mixing. Anticipating extreme and exceptional scenarios. Well, scenario planning is there to be taken. I know with a lot of our autonomous systems, enough scenario planning has not taken place. I would advocate to asking employees to actually build their own scenarios and embed them in the process and participation so that they are co-designing alongside the technologists. HR practices, do the policies actually clash with what is going on on the factory floor? Regulatory systems, are they in their nascent stages to respond to something or are we gonna end up with million dollar lawsuits, multi-system workflows and internal policies? Will we ever have no human in systems? And the answer is no. Machines have physical lifetimes. So do people, but we are able to bring in people to this process. Humans are responsible for design to a degree, maintenance, retraining, upgrading and replacing. I just can't leave the factory there like that outlet I was talking to you about where you just do self-service at the kiosk. It doesn't work like that in highly complex systems. Human training is essential for building a workforce that can identify, intervene, interrupt exceptions, especially when things are going wrong. And that socio-technical legal system is important. Who's at fault in an accident? How does human error place responsibility unfairly on workers? Oh, it was the worker's fault, when in fact, the machine has been caught red-handed. Can rigorous training protect workers both physically and legally? So robotics in the workflow is a multi-dimensional issue that requires a multi-dimensional solution. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity of going through that presentation in some level of detail, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them after this presentation. Thank you.